So Jonah, of course, is this prophet to northern Israel, and God had called him to go and preach to this city called Nineveh. But uh, if we think back to last week, we also know that Jonah didn't really want to do what God had asked because this city of Nineveh was not a very nice place. These people were brutal. They were violent people. They were cruel. Uh, They had the reputation that they would basically just lop your head off if you looked at them even funny. And so Jonah, in his wisdom, says, I don't want to go to that place. And so he hops this boat heading the opposite direction. And that's when God sends this storm. That's where we left off last week. And we see uh, kind of Jonah struggling in the midst of this storm, the sailors dealing with this as well. And this is where Jonah encounters a day of reckoning. Now, what is a day of reckoning? Well, it's a point where your actions catch up with you, where the consequences of the choices you've made suddenly are realized in your life. It's a time when you look back and say, yeah, I see how I've gotten myself into this mess. I thought of, I couldn't help but thinking of uh, our son, Simeon. Uh, he's just a little over three, and uh, uh, he's definitely, at this point in his, his young life, uh, starting to recognize that there are consequences, results of the actions and decisions that he makes. And so sometimes you tell him something and, and tell him to do something or not to do something, and he still does it, and there's maybe consequences for his actions. Or uh, even better one, uh, just recently, uh, there was a time where we said, uh, hey, you're done with those toys. You're off playing with something else. Go back and put your toys away, at which he refused, proceeded to run away, and then tripped over those very same toys. And I I don't know, parents in the room, do you just have a small desire in your heart to just start laughing? You have to hold that back, but man, I told you so. We've all experienced this. It's a day of reckoning, a time of reckoning where the decisions you make come home to roost. And no matter who you are, you've experienced this in your life where you have to deal with the choices you have made. And this is where Jonah's at. He is very much paying the price for his disobedience as he is dealing with this storm and he's having to answer a little bit for it to the sailors as well. And here's what verse 5 says, that this is such a big storm that everybody was afraid. They were throwing the cargo overboard. And Jonah, in the midst of this, he simply goes below deck where he lays down and sleeps. It's kind of the equivalent of of a, a child just covering their ears and saying, la, 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 I can't hear you. He's just ignoring the storm that's raging around him. I love the quote from Martin Luther, the reformer, on this, uh, this account. Luther says, There he lies and snores in his sins. And that's kind of the way that sin often is in our lives, where the sin has become embedded so deep in our life that We've just essentially chosen not to pay any attention to it, to just kind of stuff it over in the corner. And no matter the storm that's raging around, you just don't think about it and choose not to believe that you're responsible for these things. You sleep soundly and know there's still sin in your heart. But sometimes God chooses to send us a little bit of a a wake-up call to try to put us back on the right path. That happens for Jonah in the next verse with verse 6. The captain comes and wakes up Jonah, and he says, get up and call on your God. He's inviting Jonah to try to take a step out of his sin. But I'd like to point out the, the, the words that are used there. These, there's these two uh, Hebrew words, kum kara. In the first, in the line we have in our, our count today, it's, those are translated get up and call. And by using those words, this is the way God is. He's being very clever and he's reminding Jonah as the captain comes and uses those same words. God is reminding Jonah of the same two words that were used when he initially told Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh. And yet in just six verses, 
we see Jonah's rebellion to this invitation to call on God, to get up and do something about sin. We see Jonah's refusal. And now in his guilt, Jonah is just doubling down on his sin. He doesn't do what the captain asks. And in the process, not only does Jonah continue to hold on to his sin, but Jonah has made Nineveh's sins look so massive. Well, he just minimizes his own sin. This is literally a picture of what happens when we kind of dig in and double down on our sin. It starts by kind of going back to what we talked about last week, where we, we listen to the devil and his temptations, his promises of all the wonderful things that will happen when we do things his way, the sinful way. And we find out that those are empty promises, that we've gone too far, that now we're in the midst of our day of reckoning in life. And now that same sin too that allured us and tempted us in the first place is the the storm that's beating you down, filling you with guilt. The invitation is simply to call on God and confess to him your sin and desire his grace. But how often we do the opposite. We just dig in and hold on to our sin and refuse to call on God. Maybe in the process, we do like Jonah and and judge others for their sin while just ignoring our own. So what what does Jonah and these sailors do at this point in the story? Well, the sailors, they decide to cast lots to find out who could be responsible for this. And God makes sure that the lot falls on Jonah. Yet again, God is reminding Jonah that he certainly is the one responsible for this calamity. The sailors, they they respond. They start asking Jonah a litany of questions. Who is responsible? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And even with this new opportunity for Jonah to represent God, to turn from his sin to confess it, he blows it. He digs in even further to his sin. Notice he doesn't actually answer anything about the trouble that has been caused. He doesn't admit it at this point in the story. He talks about God. He knows who God is. He confesses who God is, but he doesn't confess his own sin. He doesn't actually live the knowledge he has in his heart. And that, ta- that terrifies the sailors. Apparently, Jonah has already told them that he was running away from God. And now they start to get the whole picture of just exactly what Jonah has done. He's running from the Lord can kind of tell they maybe realize just a small bit of the gravity of Jonah's sin. And yet in desperation, they they don't know what to do, so they try to row back. You don't do that because you might wreck on the rocks. That's a terrible decision. But so often, sin drives us to desperation. And yet again, when the opportunity is there for all of them to call out to God for his grace, for his saving mercy, they do crazy things. How often we do the same. It doesn't work for them. Their rowing doesn't work. The sailors are, in the end, forced, essentially, to call on God. And that's when Jonah is thrown overboard. The storm is calmed. And the very familiar part of the story, the huge fish swallows Jonah. And so we see yet again this week how this is a story of sin and grace. We've seen the sin that so much permeates the beginning part of the story. But here again in this part of the story, we see grace also prevailing. Pastor Chad shared with us last week what grace is, and it fits yet again with this portion of the story. We see how grace pursues us. The grace of God certainly was pursuing Jonah as he again and again reminded Jonah of his sin and offered him grace. His life is preserved as well as the fish 
comes upon him. Grace certainly doesn't really look like grace in this part of the story either because they're enduring a a storm. The sailors and Jonah are about to drown and, and, and then Jonah spends three days in a fish belly. But it's still grace. And there's, we see how grace is for everyone in this part of the story as well because grace is universally given to both the sailors as the storm is calmed and they are saved and Jonah as well as he is saved and as they all learn to call on God. And so what can we learn then from this portion of the story that's all about sin and grace? Well, three things. First of all, we certainly can see how your sin doesn't just affect you. This is essentially the whole idea of original sin. It's what Romans 5 tells us. Just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. We're all in the same boat, essentially. Probably the best use of that phrase we could ever see with the connection of to Jonah. We've seen it. When we dig into our sin, it ends up affecting not just ourselves, but our families, our spouses, our coworkers, our church family. But take a look at the second half of that verse. God desires that this righteous act by Christ would result in the justification and life for all people that all of us would have his grace. That grace would be something that affects all like sin once did and that it would benefit us and those we love. Secondly, then, a, a lack of love for God leads to a lack of care for others. We see evidence of how Jonah certainly knows God. He, he, he proclaims who this God is when the sailors ask, but I don't think Jonah has a ton of love for God in this moment. He doesn't seem to have a a great deal of care for the sailors. He's not concerned at all about the Ninevites because he's trying to get as far away from them as possible instead of going there and proclaiming God's grace. Jonah just says it's okay to snore in his sins. And so we find out that faith is way more than just the absence of hate for other people. Faith instead is actively loving all people. 1 John 4, 11 says, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Faith is wanting all people to know God's grace because we have experienced it ourselves. Jonah gets to experience God's grace time after time after time, and then he gets to proclaim it to the Ninevites because God is about everyone and offering his grace. But that means, too, that we ourselves as Christian people have a mission. Those unbelieving sailors, they they have all these questions for, for Jonah, He is the opportunity to proclaim who God is and that God is a gracious God. You know what's interesting? The the world is is, is increasingly moving away from Christianity. And yet, more people than ever say that they are spiritual. That's because though we might say we don't identify with Christianity, people still have those same questions in their heart. Who is God? Is there a higher power out there? What is all this life about? And so we should be ready with the answers. And also we should be cautious not to misrepresent by how we live the grace that God has given us. First Peter 3 there, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And so it's an invitation for us to be cautious, not to condemn evil in the world, but then turn around and speak poorly about our neighbor. That's what Jonah did with the Ninevites. 
We can be cautious not to commit certain sins and then condemn other ones. That's again what Jonah did. And we can be cautious not to ignore people who need Jesus while spending all your time with people who know him already. After all, the book of Jonah is all about God wanting everyone to know his grace, including Jonah and especially the people of Nineveh. Jonah didn't do so great a job, but people still in the midst of it heard God's grace proclaimed. This is a story of sin and grace. And in Matthew 12, we're told that for us, something greater than Jonah is here. It's Jesus. Jesus, too, came into the world so everyone would know God's grace, but he did so perfectly. This story, this truth of Jesus is also one of sin and grace. And so even when we too act like Jonah and encounter our day of reckoning, we can call on God, on Jesus our Savior, who forgives our sin and offers us wondrous grace so that grace could be then offered to those in our lives. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, what an incredible story of of Jonah to see uh, the sin that is so familiar to us, but also the grace that you freely offer us when we uh, call on your name and ask for that grace and confess our sins to you. Uh, God, guide us not to be uh, people who just sit back and snore in our sins, but instead uh, that we confess those things and that we seek to be people that uh, live our lives uh, about your grace and sharing that grace with others. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen.